Welcome everybody and uh, thank you for joining uh, today's webinar on uh, dual comp results and opportunities in uh, high temperature combustion kinetics. Uh, my name is uh, Marcus Geiser. I'm one of the co-founders and now managing director, one of the managing directors of IR Sweep. And uh, I'll be the host for this webinar. And it's my pleasure to have uh, Nico Pinkowski here, uh, who's a grad student in Ron Hansen's group at Stanford University. Um, he's been doing his undergrad in UC Boulder um, and now uh, as a grad student uh, there, uh, one of the or the first user uh, of, the, of an IRIS F1 dual com spectrometer in combustion um, applications. So I'm very thankful uh, for his input, uh, also from Chris Strand and, and Professor Hansen uh, and the ongoing good collaboration there. And I'm especially thankful for him taking the time to be the guest of honor and presenter in this webinar, given that he's also now uh, has founded his own company. Uh, so he surely has his hands full. And uh, thank you very much for, yeah, for being here and uh, telling us and everybody about your journey uh, with the IRIS F1 and also the um, results that you achieved. Thanks for um, hosting. Yeah, yeah, the pleasure. Um, so there should be a questions tab. Um, please uh, make, make heavy use of it. Um, However, we'll be saving the questions for the dedicated Q&A session in the end, not to, to interrupt the um, presentation. Uh, and then I'll be moderating the, the Q&A and Nico and I um, will be answering. Um, today, first, uh, I wanna start with a very brief overview of uh, dual com spectroscopy for those who are new uh, to the subject. Um, then very brief also how we um, implement this in the IRIS F1 dual com spectrometer. And then I'll hand over to Nico for the uh, main event uh, where he talks on uh, high temperature reaction kinetics in shock tube environments. So jumping right in, why do we think this is uh, useful? Or they, why do we think there's a, there's a challenge still in combustion? Well, um, combustion diagnostics are, are um, very demanding because of a bunch of requirements that come together at the same time. First of all, um, the reactions are very fast. So typically, um, it's microsecond to millisecond uh, um, timescales that, that, that people want to look at. Um, also, the experiments are not strictly repeatable. So all the information about reaction should come in in a single execution in those micro or milliseconds. Um, also, multiple species are, um, are uh, participating and people usually want to see all those species. So a broadband tool is required. And also, so when something is combusting, um, there's emission going on. So um, it's, it's useful to have a lot of power. So lasers come in handy. Um, and one source that we think combines these advantages and, and, and could be useful um, are frequency comms to do dual comm spectroscopy with. Um, so these are tools that have been around for around two decades and have been wildly successful um, as a tool for scientists for really high precision um, applications. And that has also uh, earned dual com spectroscopy uh, a Nobel Prize in 2005 in physics, and really the highest um, possible um, accuracy uh, has been achieved with, with those devices. And I'm just quoting one paper here. There are, are many great pieces of work, um, but just, just since there's the 10 to the minus 8 level of accuracy, I want to show what, what frequency comms really can do. So they have a lot of um, nice properties. Um, for the purpose of, of, of this presentation, uh, one important property is that the modes are locked together and therefore the uh, mode distance between those lines, multiple lines that the COM emits are fixed and we can exploit that to detect all of the COM lines in a single detector simultaneously. And this is why this method is very fast um, and uh, yeah, allows broadband spectrum recovery in a very short time and with a very high resolution as well. Um, how does this look like? Um, so we have a very, um, if you want, um, simple implementation of a COM that's just a, a semiconductor chip, a quantum cascade layer, laser in our case, which has broadband emission spectrum, order of 60 wave numbers. And then if things are done right in the device, um, the modes can lock together and we end up with a, with a frequency COM um, with a broadband continuous wave emission. Then we transmit this to, through uh, our sample. And of course, in the mid-IR, we will have, uh, will be in resonance with the vibrational modes of, of the bonds and molecules. And therefore, part of the light will be absorbed. 
and we'll have the remaining light on a, on a single pixel detector. Now, of course, this detector needs a way to discriminate all those modes of the laser. And the way this is done here is the peculiar thing about dual comp spectroscopy. We use a second laser as a dispersive element for, um, for the first laser. So we overlap the two beams of the two frequency comp lasers. Um, here we do the beam combining before the sample, then both lasers go through the sample and uh, we also shine it on the detector. Now, how does this help us to recover the spectrum? Um, in this comic picture of, of the emission lines of uh, um, the two frequency comps that we're using, um, you see there's somewhat arbitrary power intensity distribution um, and a fixed spacing between the modes of the laser. And now imagine that they have almost the, an identical mode spacing, but just one laser has a little bit larger spacing than the other. Um, and then we overlap them. So what happens? Um, you will have pairs of modes between the two lasers, the red one and the gray one. And since the mode spacings are not identical of the two lasers, there will be a difference frequency between pairs of modes that increases uh, from left to right. Um, and that means there will be beating frequencies that we observe at these um, exact difference frequencies on the detector. And now if you take a high bandwidth detector, um, and sample the signal sufficiently fast, we'll be able to recover those beating signals and match them back to the um, emission signals of the laser. Um, and that way recover our spectrum. Um, in a way, it's, it's not so dissimilar from other Fourier transform spectroscopy where you have a moving mirror and a Michelson interferometer, just instead we use a second laser. Um, and then we do a straightforward absorption spectroscopy. We absorb part of the light that will adjust the intensity of the heterodyne um, beating signal that we see in the detection system. Um, and then we know uh, what type of uh, yeah, absorbance we have. This has been become useful uh, for a number of applications in the past uh, yes, two years now since we launched the instrument. And of course, today um, we want to focus on, on combustion diagnostics. Um, I also want to mention there has been done a lot of work with dual com spectroscopy and also other work in combustion with dual com. Um, and I want to contrast a bit the systems that are around. Um, I talked about our system that works in the mid IR. So typically between 1000 and 2200 wave numbers like five or four to 10 micron. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I said we work with uh, um, diode-based lasers, so we have uh, short cavities. That means we only have a few, only have a few number, few hundred of emission modes and a uh, point spacing of a fraction of a wave number. But in turn, this allows us to be very fast because we can recover all the optical modes already in a very short amount of time. Um, there's been other work in combustion that uses uh, mid-IR uh, and EIR comms that work with significantly longer cavities um, where you get many more spectral elements. Um, but of course, the downside is you need much more time to resolve them. So um, there is no simple better. It's a question of, of what you're looking for. If you want to be in an EIR or with the fundamental modes in the mid IR and what time resolution you need and how much also power per mode you want. So um, it's a bit of a trade space there. Um, and also one thing that we think is an advantage of the mid-IR dual com spectroscopy is that it's com commercially available. Um, so we can bring it beyond the physics labs uh, to people that don't want to build systems, but do spectroscopy with them. Um, I mentioned we cover about 60 inverse centimeters. Um, so you have to choose where you operate. We have different center wavelengths readily available. We're also taking orders for other wavelengths. Um, and if you want to switch from one to the other, um, that doesn't mean you have to get a different system. It means uh, you will exchange the laser, what we call a laser module um, that you see here on the right in this slide. Um, you switch off the system, take out one dual comp module, put in a different one, wait 30 minutes to stabilize. There's no tools required, almost no realignment, and then you're good to go again. So you are uh, flexible in wavelength. Um, can then be used with almost any sample interface. People have been doing ATR drifts, um, liquid uh, uh, flow transmission for, for stop flow applications. And also people have built their own custom interfaces. You see a simple one here to the right, which is a simple reflection setup from a glass slide where a structure has been deposited. 
And of course, there are more complex um, custom sample interfaces like you see here in the background. That's a picture of the Hansen lab at Stanford um, where we have been demoing the system um, before, before the purchase. Um, in the foreground, you see uh, the system and uh, my colleague, Raphael Horvath, who has been there in the demo for the demo with me. And in the background, there's uh, Nico, who is critically examining the uh, spectrometer as he, as he should be. And with that, uh, I want to hand over to you, Nico. Oh, that was a wonderful introduction. And um, as, as Marcus said, you know, there's, there's many different ways that you can interface with this uh, dual clone spectrometer. And uh, you know, perhaps one of the most exciting for us was that we could interface it with the shock tube, and, and that you know, it's no simple uh, interface in doing that. And uh, it uh, the, actually it was, it was a pleasure working with IR Sweep um, to you know to do this proof of concept study that we'll present today. And then uh, we did purchase the system, and, and we'll be um, doing a more detailed study uh, that is that is ongoing. But what I'd like to speak about today is uh, a dual cone spectroscopy. Uh, you know, as it applies to shock tube um, combustion studies, as that is something at the, at the Hansen lab at Stanford University that, uh, that we study and are excited about. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chris Strand and Professor Hansen, who, who I see online right now, um, who are also part of this work. Uh, also, you know, you saw you saw in the previous picture, uh, you know, Allison uh, as well from our lab. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Yaming Ding, uh, Weiwei Su, Allison Ferris, as well as Marcus and, and Raphael for, for helping with all these experiments. Uh, while, while I'm presenting it today, uh, it, there was quite a number of Hansen students that involved in, in helping, um, you know, characterize and test out these, this new uh, exciting spectrometer in our lab. Today, I'd like to briefly go over, uh, you know, our efforts on a proof of concept study on propine combustion um, as a good introduction to you know how this may interface with shock tubes and be used in combustion sciences and then secondly i can i can give a sneak preview today of, of how we're evaluating a new dual comb spectrometer for use in a quantitative uh, methane and, and methane measurement diagnostic and i'll i won't spill the details until we get there but to give a bit of background i wanted to speak uh, more broadly about shock tube metrology as that, that is a you know a really great potential application space for dual comb spectroscopy, and um, <clears throat> a shock tube itself is effective. In in essence, it is a it is a heater. It is a it is a experimental apparatus that can generate high temperature and pressure conditions, uh, and this can be used to study high temperature reaction kinetics such as combustion or hypersonics, um, or or any other applications. You know, there's a representative figure of, a, of a, the end of a shock tube shown on the right hand side of the slide. And, and these tubes are comprised of, of a long steel tubes uh, separated by a diaphragm, uh, which is burst to send a shock wave down the tube, which is reflected upon the end wall. And so I've shown the end wall of a shock tube here. Uh, at that end wall condition, you, the shock reflects upon itself. And in the reflected shock wave, you can generate um, very rapidly, almost instantaneously, um, uh, high temperature and pressure conditions for which you can uh, study chemistry. And to do that, uh, our lab has, has made great use of lasers to non-invasively probe with good time resolution uh, the underlying chemistry of a, of a reaction such as a combustion reaction. And so these setups look, look very simple. And, and you know, just to illustrate it, we'll have a, we'll have a, a normal laser, perhaps at one wavelength, on, uh, shown on the right, on the left of the shock tube. Oh, could you go back one? I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. And, uh, and on the right hand side, we'll have a detector and uh, we'll measure, you know, with, with one laser diagnostic, we can you know, you know, pick off, you know, one piece of information. That's a, that's a good, good rule of thumb over the past couple of years. And this can be something about a composition. Say we can measure methane. Uh, say, you know, perhaps we can scan that laser and measure temperature a bit. Or, you know, people have even measured velocity and uh, pressure with that laser. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can we... Uh, in, in practice, what this looks like, however, is, is we're hungry for information. We don't just want one piece of information. We want as much as possible. As, as many windows as we can fit you know, around the circumference of the shock tube at the end wall uh, is the number of laser diagnostics we want and the number of pieces of information that we desire from these experiments uh, as, as it helps uncover the underlying chemistry at play. 
And so, you know, more representative experimental measurement will look like something on the right hand side where we have multiple lasers and multiple detectors and uh, an abundance of mirrors and optical components connecting all of these. And so, yeah, this is a general trend that we've seen and I've, I've worked on personally in the Hansen lab is, is how do we get more information for shock? And, and this can be very valuable as, as detailed on the, on the following slide where we can use you know, multiple wavelengths of light <clears throat> uh, to, to do more complicated uh, deduction of the, of the chemical reactions at, at play. So we recently did a study where we had nine different wavelengths of light. And you know, this is, in, in we, we measure a trace, the absorbance as a function of time during a shock tube experiment, as shown on the plot on the, on the bottom left here. You'll see absorbance on the Y and time on the, on the X axis. And each one of those colors uh, you know, is, is from a laser. This is an absorbance trace from a single laser. And you can use that to infer the chemistry, say, of one butene. Um, or you can use that to infer the chemistry of novel jet fuels, like a, a, like a C4 jet fuel that we used and we made a combustion model around. So it's very valuable to get as much information as possible and as many wavelengths as possible through the tube. Uh, and we don't want to stop at nine. In fact, you know, on the next slide, we highlight uh, some really exciting work in our lab where, where uh, Mr. Rishav, Mr. Sean, and Mr. Sean got 12 different lasers through, through the shock tube, uh, getting, going after 12 different pieces of information. And you know that includes temperature and pressure in there. And so this is another. This is a non, you know, SolidWorks rendering image of a of a of a shock tube experiment and what it actually looks like. And this is a is a, a very elegant setup. However, you see once you get 12 lasers, there's quite a bit of op optical components. You know that the shock tube is now is now you know inundated in, in optical components in order to get all this information. And this is where dual cone spectroscopy can can come in play. And on the you know so. To satiate this hunger for more information, how, how do we go after more wavelengths uh, and less optical components? And, and for us, dual frequency cone spectroscopy, um, you know, should it have the good time resolution that we're looking for, would be an ideal uh, solution for that. And so, you know, we, upon learning of this, uh, Dr. Strand reached out to IRF Sweep and we, we organized a proof of concept study uh, just to demonstrate measurement feasibility to see if it's possible on the order of our reactions. Uh, to partner with RER Sweep and, and do a combustion study. And uh, upon reaching out to the, uh, this is a, is a pretty awesome group. And in fact, Marcus, this is a fun picture I like from, you know, I think Marcus is, is wheeling the spectrometer all over Stanford campus. It was quite the adventure looking for applications. They're, they're really hustling. And Raphael uh, was, was really great to work with. There's a picture of us on the right uh, debugging things um, at the, you know, as it came, uh, is, you know, interfacing a, a complex spectrometer. It was very turnkey, but interfacing with the, another complex experimental apparatus, uh, you know, means you, you have to get the, the light in into the setup just right, and you can't have emission, and, and so it took some time and patience. And this it was, it was quite the adventure with this team. And so the, the proof of concept study we did used you know this uh, spectrometer shown on the bottom right. It had uh, 179 wavelength uh, wavelengths emitted from it between 1174 and 1233 inverse centimeters. And we use the experimental apparatus shown on the experimental setup shown on the right hand side, where we use the two uh, QCL combs. Uh, they were superimposed in the one beam and we got a, a reference measurement before we sent it to the shock tube and a sample measurement on the, on the other side of the shock tube after it, it traversed the length, the diameter of the tube. You know, what our lab also did and what a number of the, the students I acknowledged previously is we added a bunch of validation diagnostics and said, you know, we want to we want to compare the results of this dual cone spectrometer to a, to a more standard a single wavelength or, or scanning wavelengths lasers that, that we use commonly. So we put a propine diagnostic and a water diagnostic in the, and we, ha we had already a pressure transducer in there. And then we, we uh, you know, we did some combustion experiments and, and they would look something like the following. So we, we would, we would sh shock heat propine and oxygen, a 2% propine and 18% oxygen in argon. Shock heat it to a, a time zero condition um, where it was uh, 1,225 Kelvin and about just shy of three atmospheres pressure. And this is what, you know, this is a nice cartoon that I like to show of what, what the spectrometer uh, would see. And so this is absorbance as a function of wavelength. And every data point here is, a, is absorbance measurement measured by one uh, pair of comb teeth going through the shock tube. 
And you see, uh, you'll see a, the, the R branch of a propine feature <clears throat> here. And so you see a, a broadband uh, rolling feature on the left near time zero. Uh, you see some regions where, where there's a little, they're very low noise, and you'll see some regions that, that say at that 1200 where there's a little bit, a little bit more noise. And this is simply due to the, the, the power spectral density of the spectrometer is non-uniform a bit. But you see, moving forwards from left to right, as time progressed during the, during the shock tube experiment, you see the decomposition. Yeah, oh yeah, thank you. The decomposition of propine. You see this, this, this feature, the shoulder of a feature, um, decompose and slowly go away. And, it, and then you start to see these finely featured uh, met water peaks. It's a, as you oxidize propine, you're forming water, and you see water uh, arise near the end. This is a cartoon that we put together, and we took you know, 100 microseconds worth of data in chunks uh, and looked at it this way first. So this is uh, the most apparent way to look at it. But what, what I'm really excited about is, is a subsequent slide um, where you can, we can plot it as an absorption surface. And this is, this is where I believe you can get the, the, the most data out. And so uh, to walk through the plots, plots just briefly on the right-hand side of the slide, this is the same experiment where we shock heated 2% propine, 18% uh, oxygen up to 1225 Kelvin and just shy of three atmospheres. The top plot shows a pressure and temperature as a function of time on the x-axis. So the pressure shown in, shown in black, you see the, the initial shock wave um, and then the reflected shock wave boosts the pressure up such that at time zero, we have a pressure about 2.8 atmospheres. And it's relatively flat uh, for some period of time, about 0 0.8 milliseconds. And then you see you know, a very rapid rise in the pressure trace. The black trace goes up um, about midway through, through the plot and you see a very jaggedy uh, and higher pressure regime. And that's, that's post-combustion. So we, at that point we have ignited propine and, and it has been an oxidation reaction there. And the temperature, the model temperature is also shown on that plot as well. And then the, <clears throat> the bottom plot on the right-hand slide shows the wave number as a function of time. And then in the z-axis, or in the color axis, um, we show uh, absorbance. So this is the this is effectively presents the evolution of a spectral surface in time, and you can deduce very very interesting information from this. So you, looking at the arrows at several callouts, you know the, the one on the bottom of the screen sh shows shock wave arrival, and at time zero, you know this you see that propine is not absorbing before time zero. You see absorbance wise, propine is, is really at zero. Uh, pre-shock, you see a little bit of absorbance after the passage of the first shock. But then at time zero, you see a, a very uh, stark increase in absorbance. And uh, this is where you see propine uh, absorb here. And then the red region is the, the P branch uh, of this propine feature. Um, and it's a in, in plane vibrational mode. And you see, as it, you progress forward in time, you see the decomposition of propine and this, the strength of this absorption surface decreases. Uh, until about uh, you know, 0 0.8 milliseconds, you see, you see that, that feature is gone and you see what, what I like to describe as a paintbrush of, of spectroscopic features. And that is the formation of water and it's very finely featured uh, spectrum. And so there's, there's a wealth of information encoded uh, within the spectral surface. And if you look at it as an absorption surface, uh, you know, our goal is to deduce quantitative measurements from that. And so you know, we, we did write up these experimental results and try to deduce the mole fractions of propine and, and, and water as a function of time based off of that. Uh, but simply based on you know, what, what we saw there, we were encouraged that the, the proof of concept study, that there was uh, sufficient signal to noise with the spectrometer and time resolution such that it could help us study combustion and high temperature uh, experiments. And so we, we actually purchased and organized another spectrometer to arrive, and I can speak briefly to, to our efforts towards that end right now. So we, we have a current dual cone spectrometer that is, is not targeted around propine, um, but is, is more targeted around a, a quantitative methane diagnostic. And so uh, this diagnostic, the first thing to do to establish a quantitative methane diagnostic is not to put it in a violent combustion environment, but to put it in very static conditions and simply characterize this the spectrometer in comparison to the latest and greatest models. And so you know, here's a, a new spectrometer. The spectral coverage is shown by the plot, the x-axis of the plots on the right-hand side of the slide. It's a slightly different area of the mid-infrared spectrum. 
is between 1270 and 1330 uh, inverse wave numbers, uh, inverse centimeters. And we'll show that it covers a Q branch of a methane feature. And so you, you'll see this methane feature on the, on the plot to the right. And it is, uh, this is at ambient conditions, a quarter of a percent of methane and argon at uh, 300 Kelvin in, in, in almost two atmospheres. In compar comparing the high temp model to, to the measurements of this IR spectrometer. And so in the, in the previous experiments, we, you know, we, we looked at propyne oxidation in the shock tube, but we didn't compare it to a spectroscopic model. Um, you know, so that's really what we're looking to do with this current work is measure a, a dual comb absorption surface and then fit that surface to a, to a spectroscopic model and infer quantitative measurements from that. And so based on the, the plot on the right hand side, we're seeing that there's, there's good agreement just at, in characterization of the measurements of the spectrometer through the high temp model. Uh, we do see, you know, we're really pushing it when we ask it to study methane as the, the comb spacing of the spectrometer, which is important to have it wide to get good time resolution but this comb spacing is w wider than some spectroscopic features. Um, although the, the spectral resolution of every single comb tooth and every wavelength is very good, the, you know, it, the spacing between combs <clears throat> can undersample the spectrum. Uh, but overall, despite that, there, there's very good uh, agreement just at these initial characterizations between methane and, and uh, the measurement. To push it even further, we can go to, you know, you know uh, an area where we're really stressing the, the, the difference between the comb spacing and the, and the uh, effectively full width half max of the spectral features under interrogation. And this is so, you know, now we want to study this spectrometer's performance at lower pressures. And you know, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to stress this aspect? Uh, this is because in order to, to study methane in a shock tube, uh, we need to do reflected shock tube ex experiments um, uh, say we want to shock heat methane to 1,000 Kelvin in one to three atmospheres. We have to load a, a very low pressure of methane into the shock tube initially. And so we want to know, you know what that initial, and before time zero, before we shock heat it, how will the spectrometer uh, be able to record and, and will that data be able to be interpreted? And so you know, methane is very narrow if you put 50 torvit in a static cell. And, and this is demonstrated by the plots on the right-hand side. We have about the, you know, less than a percent of methane and argon at a low pressure. And you see instead of a, a, a feature, you know, a prominent feature, you have a, a sequence of very small lines, effectively, with, with some baseline absorbance. If we zoom in, uh, you know, in it, the spectrometer is characterizing this well. Oh, could you go back just one? And, uh, you know, so if we zoom in on, on one part of this very finely featured spectrum, you'll see that uh, despite how narrow the, the features are, the spectrometer actually is, is doing a very good job. So in plot C, this is absorbance versus wave number, you'll see that uh, black is the modeled spectrum and blue is the, the measurements. And you'll see yeah, every time there's, a, the, there's constant spacing between the blue measurements, and every time there is a black peak um, where there is a comb tooth, you'll see very good uh, it'll be right on the peak, even if it's on the side of a very sharp peak. Uh, this was encouraging to us. There are a couple points where we think that uh, where, where it is, you know, slightly off, but for the most part, the residual is pretty small across the board, even, even across these finely featured uh, spectrum. So next, I, we want to speak to, now that we've tested low and high pressure, we'd like to, like to test the time resolution of the system in a quantitative way. And this is because this is the fundamental, most important thing in shock tube experiments. And so you know, here, is, here is a higher pressure spectrum of methane at, at four millisecond time resolution. And this is something that is, you know, in many different types of dual comb spectrometers can do. And, and this spectrometer can do well at this time resolution as well. And we're gonna, we're gonna decrease the time resolution by a factor of 10, uh, four times now, and look at, the, look at the error. What we can expect is that the, the absorbance versus wave number is shown on the top plots and the residual versus wave number uh, between the, the model and the, and the measure spectrum is shown in, in red on the bottom plots. We're gonna look at the residual and see how it does as we decrease the time resolution. Um, what, we'll, what we've already begun to see on the right-hand plot here at 400 microseconds is that this residual, it does not appear, appear to be a uniform function of wave number. 
And so this is, you know, there, we do observe uh, what we note as heteroscedasticity in the residual in, in certain areas of the spectrum. And this is non-uniform noise distribution uh, due to different power emitted from different comb keys as we, as we decrease. And so stressing the time resolution even further uh, on the subsequent slide, we can do 40 microseconds and then four microsecond time resolution. And so you'll see, you know, in 40 microsecond time resolution, this is where you start to see you know, some regions of the spectrum, you'll see noise increase. And so looking at the residual of the right hand plot, you see an area around 1290 where the noise will increase, but you still still see two regions of the spectrum, um, predominantly 1280 and from 1300 to 1315, where the noise stays relatively low. And so we're gonna we're gonna stress the time resolution even further on the right hand plot here and see what the spectrometer can do at four microsecond time resolution, uh, such that we can measure time, methane and, and fit it to a model in a shock tube experiment. So we'll see, we'll push it down to four microsecond time resolution and where we expect noise to be in the spectrum, noise remains. But where we're looking for is in these other key regions of the spectrum, uh, we, we maintain agreement between the model and the measurements. You know, we add even down to this, this, this very fast time resolution. And so this for us was, was what we wanted to see and, and important in characterizing this noise as once we fit the modeled spectrum to the measured spectrum, we're gonna have to weigh it as a function of the, the signal to noise, the non-uniform signal to noise uh, of this. So future directions and, and why we're doing such a quantitative methane measurement is what we'd like to do is high temperature methane uh, species time histories with this and uh, temperature diagnostic. And so to do that, and, and really what our lab is excited about is we'll, we'll measure, instead of measuring single wavelength versus time, we, we'd like to measure the evolution of spectral surfaces versus time and fit it to a spectroscopic model. Uh, it is compu compu a bit computationally expensive, but not beyond what a desktop can do. But we, you know, we'd like to take an experiment like the you know, case study shown on the bottom of this slide well we'll, well, we'll do a reacting high temperature experiment. Uh, and this is an absorption surface measured uh, based on a preliminary data of you know, pyrolysis of 2% isooctane, a important fuel in surrogate studied in gasoline studies. We can watch that react and, and decompose at high temperatures to know how, how isooctane chemistry then proceeds. And what we can do is, is as, as you see, as you shock heat isooctane, you see the formation of uh, what we see here to be to be methane, and so you know moving forwards, we'd like to measure for for uh, you know engine relevant and, and combustion relevant fuels. Uh, we'd like to measure methane formation and, and hopefully temperature uh, through these uh, absorption surfaces and, and fitting to a model. And it looks like we're going to be able to do that. And which this is a pretty exciting future direction for us in, in our lab. So in conclusion, you know our proof of concept you know, look, looked pretty good. And, and our, our now more quantitative fitting to spectral models campaign is, is, is exciting. And uh, in general, you know, we have, this, we have this desire for more information for every high temperature experiment, because with more information, uh, we can draw more scientific conclusions and we can help uh, in the design and, and development of, of new combustion systems and energy efficient systems moving forwards. And a valuable tool that is gonna help enable our lab to do this is, uh, dual comb spectroscopy. And uh, in particular, uh, IR sweeps uh, QCLs uh, can pick up on some pretty good features in the mid infrared uh, with the time resolution that, that we, that we uh, desire. And so, you know, with this, we, we presented a case study in oxidation and as well as our efforts in methane. And, uh, you know, say thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to tell you about our work today. And we look forward to answering any questions you may have. All right, thank you very much, Nico, and thanks again to, to uh, yeah, Professor Hansen and Chris Strand uh, yeah, and everybody who contributed to this work. We learned a lot about this application and uh, yeah, it's been very interesting for us and uh, also a great pleasure. Um, I'll wanna pull up the questions here. Um, actually, a wealth of um, questions came in. Uh, let me read. So it says, um, in the frequency domain, we know the discrete frequency lines make a com. Can you please tell the com, um, 
can you please tell the com we get this a Fourier transform of single pulse wave uh, in time domain um, or any time domain pulses. So, um, or of many time domain pulses. So, um, the the I think the question is about how many how many interferograms do we average? Um, so we have um, a continuous wave emission from the com, unlike um, unlike the AM coms that are amplitude modulated coms uh, that are typically um, um, forming for for fiber coms. We have FM modulated coms, so we have a kind of a continuous wave emission, um, and the um, the rep rate of the interferogram depends on the uh, line spacing or, or on, it, on the difference in line spacing of the two comms and that's on the order of megahertz for our case and um, so that is a fraction of a micro corresponds to a fraction of a microsecond um, um, for, for these systems so the four microsecond the shortest that Nico has been showing is averaging several interferograms um, we do this by default in the instrument because it makes for very robust processing, but it's possible to um, access the raw data uh, and then the customer can do uh, whatever they want with it. Uh, look at a single interferogram at two, at four, at, at whatever they like. Um, then it's just a question of what still makes sense in terms of, of signal to noise. But in general, that's also, I think, a question about the, the maximum time resolution. It's, it's a a fraction of a microsecond. So a few hundred nanoseconds would be a single interferogram and also that would be the limit of the of the time resolution. Um, so then the next question is how do you model the uh, propyne to measure the concentration at high temperature and pressure? I guess that's one for you Nico. Yeah, thank you very much for the question Dr. Um, uh, Abbas, uh, I actually read your recent paper and I thought it was very good. And so uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a pleasure to get a question from you. And so actually we cannot measure the, uh, we cannot model uh, propyne spectrum yet, especially at high temperature. It is too complicated of a molecule. Um, you know, so this is, a, this is a good thing and a bad thing. It, it's complicated enough that it is very broad at, at high temperatures. And therefore it makes a good case study and first study for this dual cone spectrometer because we'll get a very nice broad feature and then as it combusts it'll turn into a narrow feature uh, being water. Um, what we're doing now is we're trying to measure something a little bit more challenging for the spectrometer which is uh, something uh, more finely featured spectrum like methane. I believe that uh, you, you measured in, in one of your papers and, and trying to compare that uh, to the model and so we, could, we couldn't actually model propyne uh, but, but and that's why we're now trying to do it uh, methane. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, we have one other question. Uh, do you account for the effect of sudden temperature change at 0.8 milliseconds for the propyne spectral modeling? I guess that also goes to you, Nico. That's a great question. And so, um, you know, what we can account for that sun, sudden temperature changes is in the modeling of water. Um, but uh, I, I hope someday that we can model propyne and these uh, broadened and these more complicated molecules, uh, but that, that we can't quite do that yet for these molecules. However, for water, uh, we did attempt, and for methane, we will attempt um, modeling across. Uh, essentially, we, we get a modeled or measured temperature profile. And then as a function of time, at every time slice we take of the spectrometer, we take a temperature point and, uh, and we, can, we can either try to ask the model in the fitting process to the data to ask us what the temperature is, or we can include the temperature that we've measured a different way um, to, in the modeling and try to infer mole fraction from that. And we can only do that potentially for water or methane now. Okay, um, moving to the next question. Thank you, Nico. Um, what is the spectral resolution you can achieve with the spectrometer, especially when you showed methane and you were talking that it was undersampled. Um, if you don't mind, I'll take this question, Nico. Um, so what is the limit? So I, I mentioned that uh, the, the length of the cavity uh, determines the uh, native point spacing. Um, but 
you can go to longer cavities, which will increase, improve a bit the point spacing, but it will not do wonders because you don't want to have a QCL that is uh, several centimeters long. But however, uh, something we've been working on, I'm actually glad this question was asked, is um, what we call sweeping. Um, so we have a spacing of a fraction of a wave number between the modes of the, of the COM, um, but the COM tooth itself is, is very narrow. Um, so what you can do to, um, to improve your sampling is basically to tune uh, or sweep the, the COM over one free spectral range. Um, with that, you can get a very, very finely um, resolved uh, spectrum. Um, this was published actually this year um, and, and the resolution of one milli wave number was, was achieved also on methane. Um, that's, I think, very, very uh, interesting and, and a good possibility. But of course, you have to know there's a trade-off between um, time resolution and sweeping. So the duration of a sweep in this case was 120 milliseconds. Um, it can probably also be done a bit faster. We're also uh, working on that, but, but that's work in progress. So if you have something that's a bit slower than a combustion, you can definitely go to one milliwave number. Um, so yeah, in a, in a matter of milliseconds that was, that was shown um, in, a, in a static experiment. So now I lost the questions tab. Let me try to bring that, bring that back. Okay, next question. Is it possible to finally adjust the COM frequency so that more COM teeth can hit the transition to improve uh, the SNR for low pressure measurements? Uh, do you want to, Nico, or, or shall I? Uh, if you have something off the top of your head, uh, please uh, go um, So I would say on paper, definitely yes. I think it's a question of convenience for the respective experiments. So um, once you tune the COM to, to a certain location, um, they stay there within a few, very few megahertz of, of drift. Um, but to get them on the peak, you would probably have to do one shock tube experiment low pressure then fit your, your model spectrum, then determine how much you have to tune, then tune, and then repeat the shock tube experiment. I think that's the way to, um, to do this. So I think it can be done um, if the workflow is adjusted to it. Um, what is your perspective, Nico? That, that agrees with what uh, we've found. And you know, because there's so many comb teeth in the, feature, the methane feature that we're looking at, has so many um, spectral features, uh, you know, just by simple numbers that, uh, you know, while some will fall in the valleys between peaks, some will fall on the sides and you'll have plenty up, up at the top of, of, of features as well. And each individual comb teeth is right on where, where it should be. And so if you're modeling, um, you know, the spectrum of that, you can expect it to, to agree with the, the model. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, perhaps that, that scanning application in the future could give you, you know, full coverage across all the features. It is really nice that each individual comb teeth, comb tooth has very high resolution. And so, you know, for us, it doesn't matter that there's, there's not so many comb teeth. It just matters that each comb tooth itself has, has very good resolution. And in that case, we can fit it to a model and, and proceed. And that gives us, actually, it's, it's better not to have too many comb, tooth, comb, comb teeth for these really uh, stringent applications that need fast time resolution as it, it, that that's increased spacing gives us a improved time resolution there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thanks. Um, one more question in that direction. Does IR sweep, IR sweep have plans to increase the spectral resolution of the dual comm source? Um, so yes, a little bit. We can do a little bit longer chips that would get the uh, spacing, the tooth spacing to a little bit lower than 0 0.2 inverse centimeters, but anything that's closer sampled than that would have to go for a for a sweeping solution, and and I think if if you're willing to do some complex data treatment, you could also think about not sweeping over the full FSR, because maybe if you sweep over a fraction of the free spectral range, you already can sample. If it's a very narrow line, you can maybe already fully sample this very narrow line, and and, and you learn a lot about your species. Um, so if you want to sweep, but still have a high time resolution, maybe, maybe a bit of a wiggling could be sufficient. That could, in theory, be faster than, 
a full FSR sweep, but that's something we would have to discuss bilaterally um, to, to see um, uh, if, uh, if and how it can be, can be implemented. It's not something we have off the shelf at the moment. Um, ah, yeah, a um, bit of a challenge here. Why are the residuals uh, larger at the extremities of the spectral range? Is this due to, uh, due to the iris F1? Um, I'll pull up these slides, but probably, do you want to answer, Nico? I'm happy to actually, yeah. So at, the, at this slide, the, the spectrometer itself has a non-uniform power across every comb tooth. The, the sum of the power, you know, some, some comb teeth have, have more power than others. And because of this higher power, they have higher signal and noise at that individual point. Um, however, we want, you know, even, even if a wavelength doesn't have as, as much power. And so what's happening actually at the extremities is that, um, you know, those wavelengths have, have less power per, per wavelength than in the center of this region. Um, but we, we still included them as uh, there's valuable data encoded in them if you can fit weighted, can do a weighted fit with signal noise included. But this is because the non-uniform uh, power distribution across the, the spectrometer uh, it's, it's not a bad thing. Uh, however, it is, you just have to be cognizant that, you know, some wavelengths are, have higher signal noise than others. And so it's, it's the same thing that happens, say, at 12, 1290 in the spectrum, is that's a, that's a small region in the middle that has less power than the regions on either side of it. If I, if I may add uh, um, to that, so this is something that's absolutely right, what Nico said, in, in my opinion. Um, but it's not something you just realize afterwards that a few lines have higher residuals and, uh, well, you just attribute this to lower power. But you do see this also in zero line measurements. So each individual line, you can basically judge the quality of that line by making an L plot for that line and, and the software does a good, good part of that. Um, so you can include this in the weighting that Nico mentioned. So if you do the measurement, you see some lines have a higher residual, but you also know if that's due to a mismatch with like if that's a good measurement and maybe um, you learn something about your your model or if that's just a poor line that's that's that might be off so you have that information um, of stability of a line in addition to the the actual residual to a fit um, and that's independent of of, of a fit um, next question uh, could you imagine such measurements with formaldehyde or nitric oxide, for example? Um, I certainly can. It's just a question of, of, of wavelength. Um, um, Nico, are these molecules of, of interest for you? I believe someone in the world has used a dual comb to study formaldehyde, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Um, and NO would be particularly interesting uh, as it uh, has, has good applications in uh, potentially hypersonics or to study vibrational relaxation. Um, so, you know, if, if we could go down, if these spectrometers can go down to, to those wavelengths and it, it does look like they can, then measuring NO would be, would be really exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Nico. Um, please confirm the 400 microsecond and 40 microsecond is the time for which methane was exposed to dual comp. Um, the lower the exposing time, the more the error in the, the higher the error in the absorption profile. Um, I think, um, yeah, was that the case, Nico? So the, how this experiment proceeded is we loaded um, this concentration and pressure and temperature of gas in a static cell. That static cell was, was, uh, was uh, resting, quiescent for uh, you know, an hour or two before the experiment. Uh, while well, we monitored the, the pressure to make sure it was mi and we made sure that it was mixed. And then we, we took a, a very long, you know, we took a 10 micro or 10 millisecond measurement um, and collected data during that measurement at uh, every four, uh, you know, continuously using the this dual comb system and it uh, gave us data at every four microseconds. And so that's how the experimental procedure uh, proceeded. And, uh, and so the, inter the entirety of the experimental uh, test time was you know, several milliseconds in that, but we were looking at, we absorbed, uh, we did a time resolved measurement there. I hope that answers your question. Uh, if, if not, uh, to the participant, please um, um, post another question. Um, 
we'll, we'll come to that at the end, end of the list and in more detail then if it didn't answer the question. Um, so next question is, um, what is the RF com line spacing? And what about the mutual coherence time of the dual com setup? Um, so the RF com line spacing, um, if, if I may answer this, uh, Nico, um, it, it's typically um, the, 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 dual, the heterodyne lines, the RF lines are a few megahertz apart, like between two and five megahertz usually. Um, there's a bit of, of wiggle room um, in, the, in the tuning of the lasers, but that's typically uh, where it is. Um, the line spacing of the optical lines is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 inverse centimeters typically. And um, how coherent are the two comms? So within the measurement duration, which is uh, several milliseconds um, in this case, um, the, the width of a heterodyne line is um, significantly less than a megahertz. It's, it's probably on the order of a few hundred kilohertz. Um, so that's the degree of coherence. And, and uh, for, for those people in the, in the with some com, dual com experience, so it's, it's free running comms. We don't stabilize them um, because for most of the applications, it's not necessary. So you don't have the collapsing line widths as you have fully stabilized uh, uh, near IR, fully stabilized near IR comms. Um, There's a, more p questions coming in and a bunch of more questions. So in case uh, some people are not um, interested in all of them, I, I wanna, um, before continuing, of course, to all the questions, I wanna, uh, yeah, again, thank, thank everybody who, who contributed to this work and all the participants um, who, who are here and have been here. Um, this will go uh, online as well. So you can, can watch it again later on. Um, I'll probably also send probably around also the paper that, uh, that Nico has been talking about in the first half of his talk um, to the participants. And I'm happy to have any, any follow-up uh, conversations as I'm sure Nico is also happy to have any, any follow-up discussions on, on, on his work. Um, so, so thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to, to uh, say this um, because this q and I think is gonna go on um, for a bit. Um, can you give us an introduction, particularly this question can be long. Um, can you give us an introduction of the process of the data analysis? Would you like me to take that on our side, Marcus, with yeah. re respect to how we process the data, the spectrometer outputs? Yeah, please, yeah. So you know, we work with IR, the IR sweep team and the spectrometer and, and what you know, we're, we get from them is uh, absorbance as a function of time or transmission as a function of time from the spectrometer through the, through the uh, shock tube. And so, um, you know, that's, that's really, you know, there's a lot involved in, in getting to that point and I'll let Marcus comment uh, to how that is, is generated. And having that, uh, we, then, we then are trying, seeking to, to fit that observance versus time profile as a function of, uh, or to spectroscopic modeling. And so we'll take you know, every time slice, say every four microsecond time slice that's provided from the spectrometer and then we'll, we'll uh, simulate a model and, and do a newton raphson method or, or gradient descent method to find the, the temperature or mole fraction uh, with the spectroscopic model in hand. And then, you know, as I, as I answered that, Marcus, I, I realized that, you know, there is quite a bit done uh, on IR sweeps end and to, to get from the, the measured beating patterns to the, uh, uh, to the absorbent surface. Yeah, that's right. So um, the raw raw data is just a time domain signal on the detector. And uh, we give people access to that if they want to do their own processing. But what we typically provide, what people like is that we um, do the Fourier transform on that. We extract the heterodyne peaks and give people the intensities of that peak as a function of time. Um, and then users can um, apply their models um, to that, but we're really open to giving access to any intermediate uh, step on there. So we, we track the peaks. Um, um, of course, there's always like some finite amount of drift during the experiment, even during milliseconds. So we, we make sure we track the peaks and, uh, and give, the, give the intensities as, as a function of time. So we give out a spectrum and that way it's not that dissimilar from another lab. Um, spectrometer that gives out um, intensity as a function of, of wave number. Um, In fact, or, uh, to add one comment, Marcus, I, I, since you provide both the time-resolved data and the, uh, the post-Fourier transform data, 
I did try to, to take my own Fourier transform in the data once, but uh, you know, what, uh, what, what you guys provide is you have a very, very adept computer at doing just one thing and that is taking the Fourier transform. And it would, it would have taken my desktop a, a fair amount of time. And so it, it is quite nice that, um, that you provide both such that I could analyze the data fully in the time domain, but it is, it was, it was really nice that you guys processed that. And, and oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, the, I maybe should add the, on the first demo that we did in Stanford, we were yet to develop this online processor. Um, but I think it optimized, uh, simplified the workflow quite a bit for, for the users. Um, so we do try to listen what, what, what people ask for in further software development, which is often um, required for new applications because everybody likes their things a bit, bit different in their application. Um, next question, um, the QCL comms were free running. Um, if there is a relative phase locking between the two QCL comms, what sort of resolution um, do you expect? So if there are some lab experiments on, on, on this, so this is not like readily available, but, but also something we, we follow. So the line width would really collapse. It would, it would go down by, by orders, orders of magnitude. I, I, so it would go down by orders of magnitude. I don't have an exact number, but really the line width would, would absolutely collapse. Uh, we just haven't done it because the applications didn't, didn't demand it so far and we wanted to go out with the system as simple as possible, as fast as possible. Um, but if that becomes um, an area of, of, of high demand, um, we're, we're open to, or we're interested in, in working on that and we follow this very uh, attentively. Um, aha, yeah. Um, Good question here. Um, how is the transformed spectrum calibrated in the RF? Um, how do you set, F, set F0? Uh, is there an analog of the uh, drifting FCO problem like in dual comms from, from femtosecond lasers? So, so absolutely, yes, the comms have to be calibrated and um, we do not have an absolute uh, frequency reference in the, in the frequency comm. We can't have that because it's not octave spanning. So you, you can't do any, any self-referencing. So um, we usually provide um, like a, a, a set of, of conditions, running conditions for the dual com, which will tell you like plus minus one or two wave numbers where it is. And then we typically um, run after we switch off the com and let it stabilize for about 30 minutes. Um, we run a reference sample that is known um, that we then reference to. Um, I guess you, Nico, um, have your own workflow for calibration. Could you elaborate on that? We absolutely. So we do both what you uh, suggested and we, we take the uh, calibrate it um, you know, using the methods that you provided. And generally that, that involves com comparing the spectrum of, the, of a, a known spectrum that we've measured with the FTIR uh, and, and, and measuring that uh, that same sample. It can be a gas or, or say a polymer with a known spectrum. Uh, for us, we prefer calibrating with the gas. And so, you know, methane will always absorb in the same locations of the spectrum. And the preferable way to calibrate it is to put a static cell of a gas with a known spectrum in there. So you put a static cell of a gas with a known spectrum in there. Um, you measure the spectrum uh, with the dual comb. And you, and you, you, after you've measured that, you know that, uh, you know the relative wavelengths of, of where, and you can pin F0 to somewhere. Um, based on that, simply by shifting the model and reducing the residual. Uh, you know, it is non-octave octave, octave spanning, um, but uh, that uh, the method of calibration we've been using so far, especially when we use a gas instead of a, uh, a polymer, using a gas to calibrate it can give you very good spectral resolution. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is about the proof of concept experiment. Um, what are the pros and cons of the dual cone spectroscopy to having the two ICLs in the, in the propyne water experiment. Um, That's a, do you mind if I take a stab at that? Please. So uh, it comes down to me. I, I like the, I see the, the pros and cons. Uh, the pros, I like to look at the math of the uncertainty analysis. 
is the easiest place to start. With if you have a single, you know, for a propine diagnostic, we're using a single wavelength propine laser. So this is a laser parked at a certain wavelength, and it is sensitive to any and all noise uh, based on beam steering as a shock wave passes through it, based on vibration of the setup, based on based on really anything. And because it is at one wavelength, we get all that noise on there. And so the, the mole fraction of propine that we calculate based on a single trace, it, the, you know, you can imagine the derivative of the, of the outcome that we measure, the mole fraction as a function of the intensity of that laser trace, it's a pretty steep derivative there. And so it's a very highly sensitive uh, noise process. When we have a dual comb process and we measure with multiple wavelengths, the sensitivity of noise on any one wavelength is greatly decreased because we have so many we have so many wavelengths through the through the tube that we're we're doing. And so in the math, in processing the uncertainty, I see that we have an opportunity to achieve lower uncertainties based on a lower sensitivity to each individual wavelength um, because of, we have a wealth of, of wavelengths. Uh, now there's there's several cons associated with that. I mean, one is that a single wavelength is a very a very live diagnostic. It was very simple and very dependable. And if parked in the right place, uh, you know, you can count on it to perform. Uh, and so, it, you know, one con of the dual comb setup, it is, is, it is more complex. You, you have to have superimposed frequency combs uh, and you're now measuring the, the beating frequency of, of these and you have to, you have a, need a big computer to calculate the Fourier transform of that. So the cons are that, you know, it takes more hardware uh, in terms of the computer uh, but it provides an opportunity, the, the pros is it provides an opportunity for reduced uncertainty or sensitivity to any one wavelength. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, thanks, Nico. Um, if you look, if you only want to have information about a single wavelength, um, you almost have to be better off with a single wavelength system because then you can use the full dynamic range of the detection system for this single um, single wavelength, whereas we have to um, share all the dynamic range of the detection system between all the wavelengths. So it's really a system that becomes useful when you want to look at multiple wavelengths um, simultaneously. Um, then a very technical question about the window materials that you're typically using, or especially in this experiment in the shock tube. Absolutely. So we use wedged zinc solenoid windows. And, uh, and this was very important, actually. This took us a we it took us a good time to prep and make sure these were perfect before we proceeded. Uh, and we, they need to be wedged as there are multiple wavelengths going through the tube. And uh, Dr. Strand, uh, you know, he was, he was over my shoulder making sure that this was perfect. So you know, props to him as we didn't have any problem if, if and if only we used that zinc solenoid. Okay. Um, next question is uh, again, uh, talking about the, or, or qu questioning about the calibration of the x-axis. Uh, did you have to adjust the x-axis uh, to better fit measurements to the high trend model? Um, that was probably asked before we, we answered the previous question on the calibration. Um, I don't think we have to um, go, go over it again. It's calibrated with a reference gas. Um, if uh, power in the lines of both the independent comms is uh, not the same, will this affect the RF spectrum? Um, while heterodyning uh, the two lines, having not equal power, will it affect the RF spectrum? Um, do you mind if I, I answer this? Um, so absolutely, yes. So the, um, the um, heterodyne intensity is um, absolutely dependent on the two intensities of the two laser modes that contribute to it. And that is also the reason why not all the um, heterodyne lines have the same SNR. Um, the ones that have lower optical power contributing to the specific heterodyne line will have a lower intensity on the, on the detection system and therefore have a worse SNR. Um, that's really the, the, the reason why the, the um, residuals in the methane experiments increase on the sides and also have this one spot in the center. That's just the intensity of the laser is lower there. Um, so that is definitely a property of the system. Um, but I wouldn't say per se it's a problem. It's just you have comparing it to a spectrally flat power distribution. You just have some lines that become better by redistributing the power and some lines that become worse. Um, so I don't say, wouldn't say per se it's, it's, it's a problem. 
um, it is making the data evaluation a bit more complex because of course you should take that into account when you um, when you fit something that some that you know that some lines are better um, better than others um, Marcus, there was a, a question I like about the uh, instrument line shape at every, what, is, what does the line shape look like at every uh, one wavelength in there? The, the line shape of one, of one wavelength? Yes, sir. Um, so um, the line shape of one wavelength is, um, It's actually something we don't measure in the, um, so, so the FFTs are so short that we have the whole, um, the whole um, line, the, the whole line intensity in the line in, in, in one data point. Um, I, if, if you take a longer, uh, these time resolved measurements in these, um, I should probably, I have the name of the person, I, should, I can probably send out the details better in a, in a graph. I'll, I'll definitely follow up with you. Um, I'll send you, I'll send you um, the, the numbers and, and the plot. Oh, so I didn't mean to uh, <laughs> put you on the spot there. No, it's good. We're just going through all the questions. And, uh, you, you, I found you, a great citation. I'll actually forward that one. It's uh, of uh, Dr. Feist, who, who did one study on the line shape. And I can share that. Um, but that, that is a good question, and I'll defer to the literature for yeah. that one. Um, so now I lost the windows. Do we need to have the same power in the comm lines? I think we answered that or something very similar before. Somebody is uh, uh, interested in the cost of the spectrometer. I think that's also not a secret. It really depends on the actual configuration that you go for. But for um, a base system with one laser module, is a little bit less than, than $200,000 in a standard configuration. And then um, it depends really on how many special features, additional features you want and how many uh, laser modules um, you want. Um, we have a few people thanking us for the webinar. So thank you very much. We're glad that you liked it. Um, and that were all the questions for now. Um, then there's a few contributions in the chat window that I'm just opening. Uh, one from, from, from your colleague, Chris Strand, uh, who's, who's greeting us. Um, then one more. Um, a while ago, I actually sent out a survey on laser modules rental, which I thought was interesting. Um, do you have an update on that? Um, Yes, we do. We do the rental now. Uh, one thing that was misunderstood by, um, or maybe we were not clear about that, is that we only rent modules to people who already have a dual comm system, a base system, because we don't think it's, it's, it makes sense to rent for one or two weeks to, to run a campaign if you're not familiar with, with the system. It's really too big of a system to just, just do an experiment with in two weeks. Um, so for people who do have a system, we now rent, rent all the modules that we have available on a monthly basis. Um, so if you have regular wavelengths that you need with your modules that you own and you wanna go to a different wavelength um, for a campaign of a, of, a, of a shorter amount of time, we'll be happy to rent you the module. And uh, the idea is to yeah, make, make, the, make the people more flexible in the, in the applications and to reduce the, the cost for trying out a new wavelength range because um, you might want to try it out before you spend uh, money on purchasing the Wukong module in that, um, in that range. Um, yeah, I think that were, were all the questions. Um, so thank you guys um, again very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'm especially happy about the um, about the lively discussion, um, so many questions, that's, that's really nice. Um, if you found that um, useful, we're having more webinars now um, on a um, two weekly, uh, bi-weekly basis uh, due to the, the corona lockdown. Uh, we thought people might be happy to, um, 
um, to have something to watch online while we can't do so many things in person. So um, yeah, please go to irsweep.com and uh, look if there's something else that's, that's interesting. I think next up is also in two weeks, a webinar with uh, Ian Burgess from, um, from Canada, who is, uh, has recently published some spectral electrochemistry results um, with the IRIS F1, so a wildly different application, um, which looks at the same technology from really quite a different angle. So we would be happy to see you there again. Um, yeah, so have a, have a great day or, or a good evening, depending on uh, where on the planet you are and uh, take care. And thanks again, Nico. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.